Hello, everyone. My name is Walter Borchenko. I'm the uh, uh, co-founder of B3K Digital in Toronto, uh, avid photographer, and I'm, I'm very excited with our session today with uh, Mark Kogel. Um, our feature today is, is, of course, black and white photography, and uh, black and white photography is, is something that is um, very historic and is, is a, a big part of how a lot of us look at photography in general. Um, for me, the definition of black and white photography came from the modernist era of photographers. And two key photographers I'd like to point out would be um, uh, Laszlo Mahali Nagy out of uh, Hungary and uh, Margaret Burke White. And, and there are, of course, many other modernist era photographers, but they, they embodied a look and a feel and a heaviness and a, a gravitas to that black and white. And, and it came partially from the fact that they're all shooting glass plate. Now, the majority of glass plate work um, embodied in that era had a certain weight and heaviness to it that I believe came from the fact that the film recorded infrared and in recorded uh, the, the visible spectrum as well. Uh, and this is where the, the phase one achromatic backs come in to kind of a really incredible kind of feel, almost bringing us back to that glass plate. Uh, the achromatic backs have no red, green, or blue filters they're completely black and white, and every filter black and white film would react to, they react to exactly the same way. <clears throat> and they embody the infrared and the visible spectrum. So, um, you know, the weight, the feel, the heaviness of them is pretty amazing. But at the same time, someone who's dedicated to using one of these black and white backs has to be a master photographer because you're not using color, you, you're using tone, and it's a complete commitment to seeing the world in black and white. And that's where we come to a uh, master photographer of uh, black and white work, um, Mark Kogel. Now, um, we have a couple of housekeeping things I need to cover. Uh, we have a questions area. Um, anyone who has questions, uh, please throw the questions in. Uh, there is a, a question about whether the session is going to be recorded. All of our sessions have been recorded, and I'm very proud as a Canadian to be uh, featuring some of the Canadian uh, world-class talent. We had uh, um, Steve Friedman from uh, Salt Spring Island. We had Andrew Latrill, uh, architectural photographer from Vancouver. And today, of course, we have Mark Kogel. Mark is in uh, Hamburg, Germany. <laughs> uh, Francesca, who's kind of our coordinator, she's uh, working out of Long Island in New York, and I'm working here out of Toronto, Canada. So we're truly global in our presentation, and we have uh, attendees from all over the world today. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, and I'd like to introduce our speaker, master black and white photographer, Mark Kogel. Well, thank you very much, Walter. I'm excited to be here. I want to thank um, everyone for uh, showing up. Um, hopefully this time uh, everything got started and you guys can all see me or see us. Um, uh, before we're going to start, I just want to also throw a, a quick thank you to uh, B3K and Walter. Um, that's the that's the, the dealer that uh, I've bought all my Phase One equipment over the years, and even though I didn't really need it to, but the few times that um, that I did need some service, they've always been there and uh, had my back, you know, pun intended. So uh, I'm really happy, um, you know, to have their support. And of course, I also want to thank. Uh, Francesca, who's here, but Phase One in general um, for putting this up. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump right in. I'm going to start with a, a slide of some of my early work. Um, I became interested in photography as a teenager, but it took uh, quite a while until I actually decided to make it my life's endeavor. I went to university and earned an economics degree before, so this really had nothing to do with photography, but um, but in this case, I, I think it did help me a little bit, you know, navigating, um, running an own business and everything. But um, but I came to Vancouver, Canada, to really take photography to the next level. Went to uh, formal education there, and the images here on the right kind of speak to that, you know, that that Pacific Northwest, um, you know, kind of scenery uh, inspired by the greats such as uh, Michael Levin and uh, and and Michael Kenna. Um, David Bedeni, lots of uh, photographers that have uh, traveled those areas and taken and taken pictures, and these all have been shot on film, actually on four by five at the time. And I just want to uh, point out something um, quick here. You know, the the image that's on the bottom right, the small one of the small squares, that's actually the exact same location, the exact same 
sort of wooden groins that go out into the ocean as the big panorama. And, you know, when I was learning photography, I visited that place probably, well, I don't know, like dozens of times. And I've always went back to the same spot. And you might think, well, aren't you getting tired of essentially photographing the same subject? For me, you know, one of the lessons I learned early on that it took actually dozens of visits to elevate my picture from what is in the bottom right to the panoramic, which I think is vastly superior, right? I've actually, uh, I've actually gone closer and I've also even tilted the camera, which is something I didn't do this in post, I actually tilted my four by five. Um, so it's not done in the crop. And once I did it, I realized that we are just, um, we're just not set up to do that. And especially in my case, I came from a technical uh, photography training background and we were told, you know, oh, you always have to level the horizon and, you know, don't blow out any highlights and your shadows and everything. And yet you look at these images and I'm breaking some rules. And I think that's important. And um, all of us kind of have to figure this out. Uh, and from this early work, uh, I'm coming to this kind of current work or, or work that's done in the last six months. And, um, uh, and you know this is this is different at the same time. It's very similar, and I remember that uh, I was asked to present my portfolio um, in a class that uh, that you know one of another instructor taught, and and I came in and and showed my work and um, and and presented you know to the group, and then the uh, the photographer that was running the show said to me afterwards, well. Isn't that interesting? Like, did you ever notice, like, is there a reason why your work is so phallic? And I was like, <laughs> wow, oh, actually, I hadn't actually realized that, <laughs> you know, but then I'm looking at these images and, you know, they're, they're essentially the exact same composition, right? There's just a whole bunch of vertical lines. Um, and, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a forest or whether it's downtown Toronto, you know, it's actually quite similar structure. Um, but then there's differences, right? One is dark, the other one's quite light. Um, one's a city, the other one is a, is a nature. Um, and one thing that they also have in common is actually they're both kind of not, again, the proper way to photograph. What I mean by that is that they both have blur, right? The one on the left, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I'm actually moving the camera, doing the long exposure that's creating this look. And the one on the right, it was actually quite windy um, and the light was fading. So when I was photographing this, um, I didn't want to go to crazy eyes. Oh, so this exposure was something like 10 seconds, but the wind was actually waving the trees a little bit. Um, and I quite actually liked that not perfect sharpness, right? The bottom of the two tree trunks, they're sharp, but the top is kind of going out. So um, there you have it. Now, a very quick um, why I do this. Well, or why do I do photography? Well, I do it uh, in a nutshell to exercise my cre uh, creativity, of course. I think um, everyone is creative. I think every every person is creative and I think everyone actually needs to be creative too. I think that's it really enriches our lives if uh, we find a way to be creative, whichever way that happens to be. Um, I also photograph to have life experiences and create memories. And that directly feeds into the next point, which is I'm interested in creating personal and expressive photographs. Um, I can honestly say that if it wasn't for my camera, I would have missed out on not only meeting some amazing people um, along the way, um, but just in general, having a great time, like having uh, um, um, going on trips and, uh, and being in situations that without the camera, I wouldn't have been in there. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, you know, the pictures are great. It's great to come home from a trip um, and, you know, sort of have a hard drive full of pictures. But I actually would go on those trips even if it wasn't for the pictures, right? The picture is nice, but the actual motivation behind it is to put yourself in certain positions, right? What do I photograph? Well, predominantly landscape and architecture, um, often together. I think that's maybe a bit of my niche, even though I, even though I, I don't want to really put myself into one area there, but, um, but I'm definitely, I have done sort of pure architecture, meaning like architecture for the architecture's sake. I've even done some commercial architecture work, which was even in color, of course, um, by a fact of it being commercial. Um, and, and I like landscapes, but I, I, I prefer to have a landscape with 
some form of structure in it, so like a man-made environment. And then how do I photograph it? Well, with the phase one um, uh, IQ 150 Aquamatic, as Walter said, I use the XF camera and also a technical camera, which is the Combo WRS, uh, that is similar to the current XT um, that phase one also has. And we'll talk about that some more. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, there, Mine there is not is. quite that. Mine is not quite as pretty, but uh, but it does the job <laughs> for now anyway. So this one, um, I don't know if this is going to play a little bit slow. Hopefully this is okay. No, it's not it super like crucial if it's uh, looks okay. Looks good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not super crucial. I mean, this is this is just a little fun from taken from my Instagram stories, and it just. You know, this this just goes to go. Like I I do travel a lot, um, and as I mentioned, the travel is actually an important part of the photography I do because the travel gives me the experiences. And it's not that it's not that I you know I don't want to I don't want to photograph close to home. I do, um, but there certainly is. Um, I, actually, I think I, I see it as a big privilege to be able to travel and and photograph because going to a different place or in my case i actually rather go back to a place that i've been before i will i will do one trip a year to somewhere new but if i can i want to do as many trips as possible to places i've already been because that allows me to dig a little bit deeper right, right. but but just being on a trip to me is, is is important part of the experience of the photography that i'm doing so Let's look at a little bit more recent work. This is all um, past six months. This is um, in the Canadian prairies in Saskatchewan. Um, I love Saskatchewan. I love uh, um, Alberta, well, anywhere really in the prairies. And it, it was the location of, of the first series that I did um, way back, which was focused on grain elevators. And I can tell you at that time, I saw a bunch of these scenes here as well but I wouldn't have photographed them. You know, when you think about it, um, especially these two scenes, right? Like the image on the left is basically a pile of dirt, right? How many people would photograph a pile of dirt, right? Um, this happens because I keep revisiting and I keep wanting to go a little bit deeper and I keep getting more and more comfortable with my surroundings and what fascinated me with this image, I mean, this is actually um, a lot of props here and some credit go to uh, a good friend of mine, Olivier Tutre, uh, who I teach workshops um, in the winter in Saskatchewan every year. Um, and I've known him for many years and, uh, and he loves photographing in the prairies too. So we go together and this photograph, actually both of these photographs have been uh, done uh, this year when we were scouting before the workshop started, because we always, of course, like to see how the conditions are because they're always different every year. Um, and, you know, there's similar photos once again in the way they're set up and they just, to me, represent that, that sparseness, that, that incredible emptiness. But to me, there's also a, a feeling of freedom. Uh, there's, a, there's a calmness and, and I really enjoy that, that these are, it, it feels like these kind of photographs are sort of the opposite of going to an iconic location. Right, and as such, I believe it's much easier to make these kind of photographs more personal, right? Because you haven't seen this a thousand times on your Instagram feed, right? This is something that that I that 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 I believe stands out a little bit, um, and it happens when you go a little bit below the surface, right? And in this case, I just I love the snow that was hanging out, um, you know, that that sort of brought out some of the texture in that dirt pile. And, you know, just to throw that in very quickly, too, we ended up actually meeting the farmer that owned that land. Um, and he ended up introducing us to his family. We got a tour of his farm. He said, hey, if you guys come back in the summer, I'll take you on a four wheeler. We go way in the back country and I'll tell you everything about farming and whatever you want. And it's just like, how amazing is that? And without the camera, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had that experience. Right. And And just being open to that. So. That's that's Mark, big. I, yes. I kind of I kind of noticed that that in a lot of your images, um, you're shooting in what looks like not, you know, not the kind of weather that most people would be photographing in. Correct. Um, so, do you mind kind of bringing that into the conversation here a little bit? 
Absolutely. Well, here's a, another good example, um, because actually it is in a lot of my work, uh, especially in my recent work. I, I love inclement weather, right? I, I love going out, especially in the last couple of years, I love going out in the winter. Um, and mostly because the winter simplifies the landscape even more. I mean, if you take this image as an example, uh, I mean, this beautiful curve in the, um, in, the, uh, in, in the hill there with, I mean, I couldn't even plant these trees in any more perfect locations. You know, if you gave me a, you know, if you think about it, a painter starts with a blank canvas and starts adding and photographers, I think we do the opposite, right? We, we, we end up in a, in a world that is often a chaos and then you start to kind of carve out your little, your little niche, right? And, um, and if you go in the winter though, to these kind of locations, a lot of clutter has already been taken away. So in a way it's actually much easier to create these images like this is, you just have to put yourself there. That's already 80% of the way. Um, you know, and, and that sounds, you know, that maybe sound too easy, but, uh, but it's, but it's really true. And, and this, uh, was taken doing uh, quite a snowstorm, right? So you couldn't see the background. So you're talking about simplifying things this way, but in another way, I think a lot of people are terrified of this, yet you're, you're creating great separation at the same time. Sure. Um, you know, but I think it's something that you should try, right? Even going out in the rain. I mean, I'm going to point point that out um, as well. But um, but you know, I've also never been, and this is the thing with like landscape photography. Like I've never been one to, and you hear this all the time, to go up only in the blue hour and you know, basically sunrise and sunset. I've never limited myself to that, right? It, for me, and maybe that's what the the trip does as well. Like for me, it's like it's such a privilege to be somewhere. On a photography trip and essentially have the whole day to devote to photography i don't want to give anything of that up like i don't want to be shooting just in the morning and then hang out for the day and then maybe shoot again for an hour uh in the evening and i mean sure the light can be very nice at those times but then you just have to make it work during the day like this was you know this was quite a clear day actually um right. and then you just you know you just overexpose it but look at that forest like all that all that snow hanging out um in the forest, like it's almost a white forest. So, what was uh, that a blue? Was that a blue sky then? That was a blue sky. Okay, so yeah, one of the questions that's yeah. come up is, can you please speak to the ability of the achromatic and its advantage uh, on the IQ 150 and these high key images? So, this is obviously something you're doing because you've you've learned this new kind of film. You've learned this this medium. Mm, yes. Um, of course, you know, it is all manipulated afterwards too, right? It's not that I don't do anything afterwards. And, uh, and also, uh, this one will be quite overexposed already in camera um, because, uh, you know, everything is white. Like, I mean, if you don't overexpose it, you end up with a pretty, you know, gray, dark, dark scene, right? So you're going to have to bring it up a little bit already at the time of capture. You could do that with any camera. Like, I don't think that part is necessarily... Uh, something that, uh, you know, that the achromatic does. And I'll talk a little bit more about, of course, why I chose that and why I think it's special. Um, but um, but, it, are, but are, you, certainly... are you filtering here or are, are you using I'm not. You're not. This is, this no, is just the, no. the way it works. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is basically, I overexpose it to begin with. Right. Uh, I mean, right. I don't want to lose. Uh, I don't want to lose detail in the highlights. So you know, you can't overexpose it too far. Um, but you definitely want to overexpose a little bit, and then I take it afterwards. And it doesn't take a whole lot. Like I don't think uh, what I'm doing is any kind of magic in the in the in the dark room because in the digital dark room because uh, you know there's so much that can already that that's already captured like this. Um, but it's true. The skies do render in a very, very nice way. All the detail renders in a very nice way, right? I mean, and, and of course, I mean, yeah, the detail goes on forever too, of course, right? If, and if you want to hold the contrast, you can. Um, but again, this could be possible with any other camera. I, I, I think it would be, right? There's nothing, I don't think there's anything trickery there that I'm doing. Um, here's, here's two other examples. This was done uh, uh, in uh, Alberta close to, um, uh, Banff National Park. And, you know, once again, I, I was really happy. Like that day was was basically just an extra day I had. I had no plan. Um, you know, and I talk about that a lot in my workshops, right? Like how do you how do you plan your shoot? And 
you know, should you have a point of departure and uh, or should you be open to whatever presents itself? And I think the best answer in a nutshell is you should have both. Uh, right. So in this case... Explore it, right. <laughs> right, well, exactly. Like you have to have some kind of... I believe you do have to have some point of departure because you need to know what you're looking for, right? And then you have to also think about where can you go to actually find it? You don't want to be aimlessly, completely aimlessly going around. Um, and a part of departure can be can be as simple as, hey, I, I got a car, I got the day, I'm just gonna, you know, this is the road I'm picking and I'm just gonna go on this road and see what I find, right? Like that's all it has to be. And that's what I did here, right? And right. to me, it's just- The, image, you know, the image on the right though, I think it really starts to show that black, that heaviness with detail that is so hard for most people to achieve today. Did you do anything special to hold that contrast range? Um, well, this was, oh, let me remember. Um, well, I am definitely, I am definitely careful about that, of course. Um, and, you know, you do have, I mean, I use Capture One, of course, for raw conversion. I mean, I, I don't actually even have another choice. Even if I wanted to use Adobe, I couldn't um, because my raw files don't get, uh, don't get read. Um, but, uh, but of course, that was, I mean, it was painful at the beginning, but I'm so happy I invested the time in Capture One. Um, because I think this is partly also because uh, because Capture One lets me keep all that detail and you have those controls for extended dynamic range. Um, and then once you got it, I, you want to add a little bit of contrast to it because I don't want those details to be muddy either, um, right? Uh, but it again, it's it's really, uh, it, it comes down to making sure that you capture it in the first place and um, and you know, if you have if if, if you have a, a higher quality camera, you might be able to get away with one picture. You might have to you know take multiple pictures. Um, if your camera is a little bit simpler one, it's it's possible though, right? right. Um, and then careful processing. Like I see a lot of people over processing, right? right. Uh, and and that's something you definitely want to be want to be careful of. But again, there was no filtration on this one. Um, it was just ex careful exposure in the field. Um, and then fairly simple post-processing afterwards, but of course, making sure that you're not losing the detail where you don't want it, right? So another question is coming here that kind of um, relates to this a little bit, and it's it's a two-part question. So does, does does this picture specific, we're talking about these images here, yep. would it be the same emotional response and color? That's the first question. Second question, part of that question is, is there any specific thinking in composition when you work in black and white or when you take in black and white? Oh, those are two very good questions. Right. Uh, thanks That's for pointing. Uh, We're getting some great questions, so, you know. <laughs> no, you are, those, those are really good questions. Well, okay. So first of all, these particular images wouldn't be all that different in color. Uh, and the reason they wouldn't be uh, is it was an overcast day, right? And and yeah. and these are relatively close up, right? Like th this one, I'm I'm also kind of moving away in my photography from those ultra wide angle. Like I had those days where I needed like a 10 millimeter lens if they made one. Uh, and now, you know, in the last few years, I'm getting a little bit tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, and and really, if you if you use a tighter lens, you're able to in a way it's almost easier because you can pick out these perfect little pockets, right? So. So you know this is this is basically of how that composition was done, and there wasn't much color in that. Now on the one on the because also this is winter, right? So there's no green leaves, right? Right. If you did this in the summer, you know, yeah, you would you would you would certainly get uh, a little bit of color in there, but but here, not a whole lot of difference, right? Right. Now the second part was. The second question was if the emotional response would be different, right? Well, it was it was um, asking essentially if um, the if it, this affects the way you do your composition. Does black and oh, when you're sorry, that's what it black was. and white is your composition? Do you compose differently? I guess, right? Mm. It's interesting because I do not shoot color, so I actually don't. You know, <laughs> I I, I, I suppose. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question, right? As I said, but you know what? I think I think what it is is that uh, in black and white you don't have to worry about color, right? Like I don't I don't I don't have to I don't have to worry about oh there's maybe uh, you know a red boat in the background that might distract the viewer because it's the only red color in the frame. 
Um, if I wanted to take a color photo, maybe I want to include that boat. And so I make my composition so that it's in uh -huh. there, right? And then draw the viewer. In these cases here, in these two images, I don't think I would have composed it any different way because there really wasn't much color there, right? Um, but I think that's probably the best answer I can come up with, right? Uh, a, a color photograph should be about color, right? If, if color isn't important in your color photograph, then why didn't you do it in black and white in the first place? <laughs> right so so therefore therefore i think that your composition if it's about color and there's an there's an important piece of color that you want to you know the one that you want to have inside your image then you have to make sure that it's somewhere in the composition right. um but if the color isn't important you know in this case it's uh, i mean the one on the right is obviously about the one full tree but the sort of lonely tree with uh you know all the family members all in the back um and in the back i don't i don't um i don't care that much about the detail on on each one of those um trees i just care about that you see there's a whole bunch of trees in the back and it's about sort of the outlier that's in the front um right the texture the, the the, exactly and, and and again there's no color there and the image on the left is just the continuation, like those lines in the snow, continuing those vertical lines of the tree. Like there's there's a there's a story there, I believe. But I think right. the emotional response on these two really comes from the ability to, or, or not the ability, but the the closeness of the composition. You know, like I couldn't have done this with a with a ten millimeter lens. Right. If that makes sense. Um, now these two. Uh, we're done in Iceland, and um, and this also goes to show about, you know, I had a different plan uh, that day. I was driving along, you know, uh, just the the, the South uh, Ring Road, uh, which uh, you know, I mean, I've been so many times that uh, that's actually quite hard for me to still get inspired there. However, the weather is the best part in Iceland, right? It's always different. So. Um, even though I've been there many times, uh, I, I just uh, you know the weather always has, has gifts. And here I saw this little bit of mist out uh, um, over those. That's actually uh, Westmanier Islands, and and I just said, okay, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take this next road, and I'm going to go down there and see if I can get all the way to the water and photograph this. So my idea that my my image in my head was the one on the right, right? I thought, okay, I'm going to go right, you know, to the ocean and photograph this. But on my way there, um, this is literally the road that I was going on, um, and it's not really a road, as you can see. That's like some kind of dirt, uh, which you'll find in Iceland often, right? Some kind of uh, dirt path. And all of a sudden, I see, uh, you know, these these leading line made of snow. And that image on the left is actually photographed sitting in my car, and I have the visor down because the sun is coming straight into my face. So I'm using the visor to essentially shade the light, uh, shade the sun coming to, from coming directly into my lens. And, uh, and it created this kind of peekaboo effect, right? But with the, with the leading line, it worked really well. And then I continued on and I, I, I got the scene on the right afterwards. And of course it's the repetition of shape here. But once again, like I wouldn't have composed any differently for color. Um, I don't think color would add anything to this. Um, right it because it's about shapes it it really is about shapes and and they don't really need color so so we've had a few more questions pop up uh with these sure. images and maybe these ones would actually be stronger here um okay. with the introduction of the new software for black and white and how they change a tonal range is an acromatic camera even necessary and uh you know it's it's an interesting uh question because it would come from someone who's actually never experienced one of these backs um so from from your standpoint what what are your thoughts on that well um i mean i'm not going to say that uh that 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 any photographer needs an achromatic back um you know i don't uh, <laughs> I, I don't i don't think that's true right it's it's a it's a choice that you make and uh, and i guess you know and, and can similar images be taken with a regular camera yes they absolutely can right um, but um, but it's the it's the choices that we make, right? It's um, you know does does a Golf Volkswagen Golf get you from A to B? Uh, sure it does. You maybe don't need a Porsche, right? But if you have that um, and you enjoy it, 
then it gets you there and you will know why you prefer it over something else. Um, and so would you, would you say that the fact that you're using an acrobatic back, does that, does that affect how your images turn out? Uh, it certainly does. It certainly does. Um, but it, it, but it does, and it does certainly in terms of the, the quality standpoint, right? Um, and that's what, uh, I think that's kind of what you, what you get out there, but I, but I have a slide that, that addresses that coming up. To me, the technical is actually not the biggest reason for going with an achromatic back, right? Um, even though, of course, I love the images it creates. And to me, I think it's just, if anything, it is just easier, much easier to get to these kind of images. Um, because if I, if I want to do these in color or with like a regular camera, I could do it, um, but it would just require more work. Um, and, and also I might second guess myself along the way because uh, I might actually get distracted by a color and might decide, oh, well, I have the color, so maybe I want to keep it, maybe I want to go there. Uh, to me, just making that commitment and saying, no, I'm just, I'm all in on black and white. That's what I do. Then you don't even have to worry about, you don't even have to be distracted by color. Like this is the decision that you made. That's the commitment you made. And I'm just, I just try to stick to it. So truthfully, right? it's, it's the fact that you're so focused now. Well, it's getting rid yes, of those for sure. it's, it's just focused. So now it's all about composition, which comes to a question, you know, um, how important is is uh, contrast? Um, isn't the contrast of the scene more important black and white than it is in color? Um, well, I mean, I don't think so because when you when you look at uh, uh, the definition of contrast, I mean, contrast is the same in a, in a color photo as it is in black and white, right? And I think what happens sometimes is people uh, think about contrast um, in terms of like being maybe they're more in black and white, especially these are examples of very contrasty images, right? Uh, and contrasty really just means there's a big difference between highlights and shadows. Like the, the shadows are very dark, uh, the highlights are very bright, right? You have that in color as well. There's nothing special um, about that in black and white. Um, and I've shown you images already that are lower in contrast. And you can have, yep. you know, those high key images are, are you know, they're a little bit lower in contrast, right? So I, I don't think you need to go for that in particular. Uh, I just, in these images, I really wanted it because it suited these particular images because I didn't want you to see those details. It's in a nutshell, if I make something black, I do it because I don't want you to see those details there because I don't think they add to the image. Well, um, and quite a few right? questions come up, right? So, so I think you're touching on another question here, and that is, how do you ensure that negative space is not empty space? Like, I, and you have a lot yeah. of negative space in your images, but there's something going on in all of them, right? It's think so about how you, think about the shapes. Think think about you know. Well, okay, that's that's another really good question. <laughs> uh, so I guess first of all. <laughs> good you know yes yeah you're doing a good job walter thank you <laughs> it's great and the audience is doing a great job too so um thank you everyone for posting those excellent questions um i think that uh, you know first of all you shouldn't be afraid of pure black and maybe that is actually a little bit of a difference between black and white and color because in color yes you might want to be a little more afraid of pure white of pure black and pure white Right, and and that has to do with, and I'm going to talk about that later a little bit more too. But this has to do with, we see the world in color, therefore we have certain expectations of how the photographs should look like, right? right? Black and white, yeah. we do Emotions. not see most of us anyway, right? Don't see uh, the world in black and white. So by going to black and white, we're like kind of that one more step away from reality, and in a way, I feel like there's an opportunity for us to kind of create that reality the way we want, right? So, um, I mean, on the image in the middle, there is some blacks that are pure black. And that highlight in the, you know, in the sun, that's the sun actually peeking through, kind of trying to burn through uh, this, uh, this fog. And, um, and that's very close to blown out. Now, the only reason it's not blown out is because you don't want blown out highlights in your prints, right? Which is another whole discussion. Um, but pure blacks, I'm okay with. Like that's fine, as long as it still has shape. Like if you look over on the the image on the right with the tree, right? Uh, that 
that hillside that the tree is coming out, that's pretty much black, right? But the shape remains. So right. it's okay to have it be pure black as long as there's a, a contrast behind it so that we can still identify the shape of it, right? Kind of I don't really need to see the detail right. in that hillside, right? Okay, so that, um, that kind of brings us to another similar question. And even this image is, is good with this. It's saying, do you feel that using the achromatic back is more like using black and white film than digitals uh, as, as no conversion uh, from color is needed? To me, uh, these recent images have a more film-like analog feel to them. I have to agree. They do yes. have a very analog feel to them, right? Yes. Well, and, you know, quickly before I answer this, one thing I want to say here, you see here, I decided to actually keep the detail in the trees, right? I could have gone for blackness, right? right. I mean, you, 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 can, you, can, you can do that. You have that creative license, right? Um, but if I had gone for blackness here, I feel there's just a little, there's just a bit too... Uh, it's hard to say how to say it. There, there's then there would be too little information in this image, right? The reason that I have some detail in the trees is that there's something for the viewer to look at. And of course, there's the there's the detail in the wood of that old cabin hanging out um, in the snow. But if that would have been the only detail, maybe that wouldn't have been quite enough, right? So yeah. that's why here I decided, okay, let's keep some of that detail. Um, so that's that's to finish that up. And then to address the other question quickly, uh, yes, absolutely. Having the achromatic is like working with film, and I come from shooting film, and that's right. why I like I like that. There's some there's something in me that that always enjoyed that, always enjoyed using film, and I get a lot of students that have never touched film that have come up with with a digital camera, and I note that there's two big differences. That's not the only two, but two big differences between digital and film for most photographers is that if you did film you likely started with black and white like i did right but yeah. color all by default, uh, but but digital by default is color right digital by default is color so going to black and white kind of requires an effort while if you're like me if you're 12 and you're getting a darkroom set up oh. and you're just excited to start to get going you cannot do color at home like that's really difficult so you do black and white. So for me, photography started with black and white, not with color. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's a pretty big difference. Um, Great. And uh, and I th and I think it's nice to have, and, and I like to maintain that. Now, if you never shot film, it is completely okay if you if it's harder for you to kind of get excited about black and white because you've went from you've only really known um, color, right? Like that's the default of digital. Right now, these two uh, I've thrown in there because, uh, well, these are the these are the only two. But uh, but these both images were taken with an iPhone, um, and the reason I put them in there is uh, is that uh, you know they're I I love both of them. Right, I wish I had my real camera, <laughs> quote unquote real camera, uh, to shoot these. Um, but at the same time, I'm just happy that I got these images, um, and uh, and so you can see like. A lot of it is possible with other cameras too, right? Uh, because it also depends on the conditions. I mean, especially with the one on the right, that was just a phenomenal snowstorm. Nobody was out. I mean, coming back to an earlier question, right? I mean, people were inside, snow was blowing. You can see in the image, the snow is blowing sideways. Um, yeah. And actually the reason I don't have this on my, on my phase one is that that's taken from inside the car. I didn't even want to go out because it was so miserable out there, right? And I shot this through the car window and then, you know, I actually, and so this is even processed on the phone too, um, but I didn't process it until I got back to the hotel and I'm, uh, and I'm so angry at myself because had I seen this and I kind of saw it, but, you know, I, I was, this was doing a workshop too. So, uh, so of course I'm not there to take my own pictures. I'm there for everybody else. And people were just, you know, Hey, let's get, uh, let's get a warm drink. Let's, let's go inside. So, uh, you know, in, in, in all honesty, I couldn't have spent the time to really set this up and, and do it right. Uh, so I'm happy to have this record of it. But it just goes to show if the conditions are right, you know, you can do it. There was nice light on the left, too. Um, you know, the difference if I had this on a phase one, of course, I could make I could make a, a decent print of it, which I can't from the iPhone. Um, and of course, I have no detail in the shadows and I can't bring anything of that out. 
um, but it's actually a long exposure mode on the iPhone, which, you know, you see the water is kind of smooth um, and it's pretty incredible. The iPhone has it, but of course the face one has it too. And, and I'm showing this partly because it's, it's kind of similar, at least in my mind, it's kind of similar to frame averaging. Uh, which Walter might be able to correct me on if that's actually if they're actually doing the same thing, but yeah, um, it, we're going to come similar. to that. But we, once you get to another image where you've done either a long exposure or something special, let's let's we have some questions about that specifically about the soft look. But let's ask those questions once you get to another image. Okay, so, sure. Sorry. It's coming up soon anyway. Um, this is because this is obviously not a long exposure, right? So, uh, so this is, uh, and you know, some of it, some, some of it, if you want to create something like this is to, uh, I went to, um, I went to Japan with Michael Levin uh, a few years back and, and he has some, some great images from inside tunnels and, uh, and even like Michael Kenna way back has images too. Uh, so it's been on my mind for a long time, but, um, but you know, you have to find the right tunnel where a, it looks good and it doesn't have, you know, a bunch of signs in there or other things. Um, but more importantly, even you're able to kind of pull off with the car or like walk in or like be inside safely to take the picture. And I found this tunnel in Senja, Norway. And, um, you know, and this was all about, okay, I'm going to go there right after sunrise because I want the light at the end of the tunnel. So I can't go in the middle of the night. But if I go right after sunrise, hopefully traffic will be low, which turned out to be right. And there was a pullout to the side so I could leave the car there. And it doesn't really look like it, but it's actually a, a tiny sidewalk on the right and left there. So, so that was all there. So when you actually think and photograph through like that, um, to take it, again, I could have taken this with an, with an iPhone as well. Um, but you know, when you, if, you, if you look at the actual, like, you know, if you look at the four foot print of this, the small subtle detail that's in the ceiling, which might even be hard to see that on um, um, on the webinar now, it, it just there is a beautiful amount of detail just goes on forever. And even the road is not pure black, right? So that was also earlier question too. Like I don't want I want this to be dark because it's not right. important to see every detail, but you don't want it to be detail lost because if you have the opportunity to see it in high quality and large. It's it's nice to have somewhere else for the eye to look, right? But you're you're also able to do that and retain it. There there's a lot of questions about lenses. People are asking for you to say what focal length lens you used for a lot of these. I've got sure. quite a few questions. So do you mind letting us know what lens did you use here? Do you know? Um, this one was uh, oh, this was a little bit longer. I think this was my 80. So now the 80 is uh, is 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 a, is roughly a 50 on full frame. Something like that, Walter? On the DSLR camera, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like close Just, enough. Um, yeah. So not 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 a wide angle, right? Because I want this is all about the this is all about the uh, the the leading line uh, that goes to the end of the tunnel, and by using a slightly longer lens, you're starting to compress a little bit, and and so by compressing, you're actually bringing out that leading line a little bit more. If you shot this with a with a 15 millimeter. Uh, you know, the, the, the end of the tunnel is too small, right? Like it, it just, it wouldn't work. Uh, and if you use too long of a lens, you don't have enough sort of, I'm calling it the negative space of the inside of the tunnel. You don't have enough negative space of the inside of the tunnel around to frame the exit of it, right? Um, but I can mention this to you guys. Now, this was um, quite a wide angle. I'll talk about this again. This is where um, uh, if you think back to that image in Toronto, where I also have that uh, out of where I have that movement effect, uh, I tried. I challenged myself. I tried to create this in in um, Photoshop. So uh, so this is this is a regular picture, quote unquote regular picture, like a sharp image um, with no movement while I captured it. But then uh, when it got into Photoshop, I tried to create the movement. Um, right. And I mean, I was somewhat successful, but this took hours and it's a seven gigabyte file. <laughs> so it's not fun. Like the ability to do this in camera, like while you wait, way better than, you know, and, and then it actually looks better even in camera too. Um, but, uh, but this was uh, quite a wide angle. This was my 23 uh, on a uh, combo, right? Because this, I was pretty close. I'm on another building. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm about 10 stories up or something like that, and then photographing across for this building. 
Um, but of course, it's going to be wide angle because I want some space around it and I want to actually get the entirety of this incredible huge um, building in there. So I have to use a wide angle. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> so let's, let's stop here for a bit for questions. Um, okay. Because, um, we have a number of questions we didn't cover. A number of people, there's a lot of different questions coming in. So please keep those questions coming in. But in a lot of your images, you have separation. So I'm going to try and amalgamate about a dozen different questions here. But it seems like your background, you have blurry in, in different parts of your images that really seem to create a separation. How do you do that? Mm. So remember, a lot of people don't understand how these phase one backs work, Mark. So talk about this strictly from a technique standpoint. Okay, well, um, one thing that is not that often talked about um, when you step up to a larger sensor, and this is, this would be true if you're going from like a micro four thirds to a, a full frame DSLR too, um, you start to notice that, that what I would call images feel more three dimensional. Um, so there, so some of that, there, there, there seemed to be a separation there. Same thing with film, right? If you went from 35 mil to uh, medium format to large format film, um, it was also quite, quite obvious. True. And, yeah. um, what, and what I do is I shoot fairly wide open most of these images. Like I don't shoot at F16 or F22. Um, a lot, I, I'm, I'm, I usually shoot at 5.6, sometimes F8, and very rarely um, do I go F11. Uh, I sometimes use focus stacking, which is a whole other discussion, you know, to get a little bit more focus where I want it. But but um, right. but the point is, you know, this particular image uh, I believe was at five six, uh, and you know, if you really zoomed in, you can see that the front of those planks there, the walkway that goes there, is not fully sharp, right? Because I want you to look at that structure, like I want you to look at the building, right? Um, right. And that. And having that large sensor, because of course now going from like a full frame DSLR to medium format, there is a three dimensionality in the images uh, that um, that you know it's hard to put a finger on. But obviously you guys noticed; otherwise there wouldn't have been questions about it. Um, well, I mean, you certainly noticed it if you got these images on your computer. I'm just going to kind of cover off a few tech. There's a number of questions that sure. come up. Thinking of black and white is 256 shades of gray. All the phase one backs operate at 16 bits. So this is 65,000 odd shades of gray here. But yes. in addition, yes. we're dealing with 15 to 17 to 18 stops of range, depending on what mode you're shooting in. Yes. Like there, there, is, there is a whole bunch of other technical stuff. And then from the technical, just again, trying to cover a lot of questions, like your background, your sky looks like it's blurred. So what did you do to get that? Well, so this is a long exposure, right? So, so this one is a, I believe, is an eight-minute long exposure, uh, and I use long exposures in a lot of my images, right? So that's that's part of what blurs the background as well. It's it's just the fact of using a long exposure. Uh, so that long exposure simply will make the, the the clouds appear smeary, right? Because they are moving, but of course, anything like you know the walkway and the structure and the foreground does not move, right? So that's maybe your answer for that. Try to so, keep it so what you're really saying here is you're using focus, as in the foreground here, using long exposure to blur out the background, and you're mm -hmm. using the ability of the medium format sensor to throw so much more three-dimensional look to images, and that combination creates this shot. Because in real yes. life, this image printed is absolutely stunning. You know. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's some, it, it is all of that sort of coming together, right? And, and really, when you think about, I had a student once in my long exposure workshop, and, um, and, she, and she introduced herself and said she's an artist, and she, and she was really, you know, you, I, I tried really hard to get her to understand the technical, um, because that's really why she came, because and she, and she had a very good grasp of the, you know, of sort of the, uh, the composition part and, and sort of the artsy part of the, the, the process. So that was good um, because it's actually, I think it's easier to teach the technical than it is to, to teach anything vision related or even composition related. Um, but yeah. the, way th the way what she shared with the class, I think was actually quite nice. I hadn't heard that before. She thought that, hey, if you're doing a long exposure, that's a method of silencing the clouds <laughs> or 
if you use it other way, you can use it in another way, you can also yeah. aggravate them. But in this yeah. case, I think it's a great description. I'm silencing the clouds. I don't want you to look at a bunch of single puffy clouds in the back because that's going to distract you away from what I want you to look at, which is the building, right? So by going with a long exposure, now the clouds are all kind of smearing there. They're there and there's highlights there and there's contrast there. And, and, and you know, technically it's incredibly smooth, right? Coming back to, again, this this back, like the, the amount of richness and tonality in the back is like, you know, what you could only get on really large format film. Um, so that's a little bit of part, that, that's all part of it, of course, too. But the fact is, I, I want the clouds to retract a bit visually in terms of visual importance. I want them to be there, but but you you should look at the structure itself. So then this leads into another question that's come up is how do you meter? Like like people are asking, do you rely on the <laughs> camera for metering? I mean, I, I know for a fact that this didn't meter the way you shot it, right? Uh, no, uh, probably didn't. <laughs> <laughs> or very likely did not, no. Very likely, um, but you know. No. Yes. But you know what? I've I've had before I got the XF, right? The XF body for the um, you know, for the for the phase one. Uh, I was using the combo, which has been around for quite some time. And the combo is completely manual. Um, and you know, so initially, so so and now that I have the XF, which has autofocus and auto exposure and all of that kind of stuff, well, that's I don't it. use any I, I, I don't use any of it. So the short answer is I did not meter this. Right. And and the reason I didn't meter it because I didn't have a meter. Right. Or well, actually, this is shot on the on the combo. I had my XF, so I guess technically I had one, but but I'm not interested in it. I just I take a picture. Um, and you know, I have a nice big screen and I can I can look at the histogram and you know, and yeah. I can, I can right. get that's, it. That's that's what you look for, right. Yeah, and I can get it where I want it. But I, yeah. you know, not 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 to brag too much, but also with uh, with this back um being able to capture so much like i mean i could I, I could be off by five stops and still rescue it as well right right i mean i try not to obviously um but um but you know but the point is i just i use manual and i build the image and sometimes i've had this in in, in workshops you know where students I, told, I tell them to go to manual and they're not used to it and they come up with an image that's like you know seven stops underexposed but all of a sudden their face lights up and they're like, oh my God, this looks amazing. And it's- They find something, because, it's a happy accident. Well, yeah. well, that's the thing, right? Because you would never, if you no, use the metering, you yeah. would never get Absolutely. that, so you don't see it, right? Okay, so I found image, it actually quite nice. I have one more question about this image and we should certainly keep going on, but um, many people have asked, a lot of your images look like they have a vignette. Are you vignetting them intentionally or is this an effect of the camera? No, I'm doing that intentionally. Okay. I'm doing that intentionally. Yeah. Um, it it can be if you want to be really technical. It it can be an effect uh, of the if you use the technical camera like the combo. And I have an example later on if we get to that uh, that will show you some some natural vignetting. Um, but uh, but I love vignettes because of course it it's another tool that lets you focus right. the viewer's attention where you want it to go right so i i use it a lot and if it's but if it if it happens naturally i usually embrace it um, right. but if it doesn't happen naturally i just add it after all right right so here's uh the last one of this first little image show um this is uh, a 60 minute exposure so this is going you know pretty much as long as uh officially the phase one goes um and uh, you know, and and this is the moon essentially rising, okay? Uh, so you have this 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 moon trail. And uh, what I just loved on this one is that, you know, once again, this is such a touristy location. There's I don't know how many pictures are being taken there, and uh, and I've I've took some of those pictures too. Hey, because I was there, it was my first time in Paris. Um, it's the Louvre, actually right? happened last. Yeah, it's yeah. the Louvre, right? So, um, and I've never been to Paris until last year. I don't know how this happened, but it, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so then when I got there, of course, I took some of those overall and, you know, shots of the pyramid and everything else. But then, uh, but then I, I saw them, I saw the moon appear and I checked on my app and I was like, man, it's going to go in that direction. Amazing. Yeah. And of course, that's the juxtaposition of the triangle of the pyramid. And so it's just a different, yeah. just trying to work with it. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So this was supposed to take a lot less time than it did, but there were some really good questions. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some of it a little bit faster because we actually already talked about it. So uh, yes, I started in the dark room, as you can see here. I also, um, I found this picture, my very humble beginnings. I had an SLR, I think I was doing macro or something. Um, and I was probably 17 or 18. <laughs> and uh, I still look like this today when I take a picture, meaning I, I put my tongue out apparently, um, my <laughs> students tell me. Uh, and then uh, uh, this made me laugh so much as a friend of mine um, that uh, showed me this shirt. And uh, it does describe not just me, I think it describes a lot of us. Um, but I actually think there's a serious point to this. Um, and uh, And the serious point to this is that Sure, it's nice to have the latest and greatest and update and upgrade and, and try different cameras. And I've done a lot of it, but I actually find that having too many cameras, it's like having too many lenses, having in general too much choice. It's like once you find something you like, you should stick to it because otherwise you never really know it inside out. Right. Like explore and so, it. really explore exactly. It, right? Yeah. And right. so, this is not like, you know, yeah, I mean, I didn't initially, quite honestly, I didn't even want to go with the IQ4, not because I didn't like it, but because, hey, I know the IQ3. I, I Do I want to change that up again? And luckily, there wasn't really that much change there. Um, so you know, when I did it, I'm super happy now that I, that I did it. And it was very similar. But there always is a bit of a learning curve, right, with every new piece of kit you get. Um, so you know, that's, and then this basically is my darkroom of today, right? And I just wanted to throw that in there to say that uh, printing is why I do this. Like printing is why I do photography. Without the print, in my mind, you haven't actually finished the act of photography. Um, as nice as Instagram is, as nice as, uh, you know, sharing work online and, and on your phone screen and whatever else, like it's great. It's a big part of photography too. But, uh, but if you haven't ever printed, it's it's just it it again this comes from the dark room and and again if you've never if you've gotten into digital photography sort of when you got into photography and you kind of skipped film and the dark room then I think it's it's quite unnatural for you to think about printing but if you come from the dark room if you've ever you know printed I think it's very natural that you want to keep doing that when it comes to digital. And of course, that's one more reason to go for something like a phase one in general, not even you know any phase one, um, because the quality for for printing, you know, you see, it's it's interesting. Every I guess pictures were questions were posted where people seem to already see a difference in these images, even though we're looking in them on a webinar. Right? Like like usually there's not that much of a difference that you see there, but but if you see that if you see those images uh, differences already, wait until you see a print, right? I mean so that's I'm, where I'm the just going to cover comes a up. couple of quick technical notes. Um, there are a lot of people who are putting up questions who've never worked with a phase one back. So I'm going to just throw this out as a challenge: rent one, sure, try sure. one. It is a different experience. Uh, people are saying, how you know, what do you deal with the noise on a one hour exposure? Well, there is no noise. <laughs> you know, There's you have to no try noise. to believe it, right? But one of the questions that came up was, you know, how did you plan that moon trail photo? Did you plan it or was it just there and you went for it? No, that that actually that actually was planned. Um, but it was planned after the fact. I was I was in Paris for a couple of days uh, and I was um, quickly go back here and I was there uh, and it just happened to get dark. Right. And I was still out, of course, <laughs> to maximize my time. And I see the moon rise to actually the way this is rising, right? So the so I see the moon kind of peeking up at the bottom there. And I instantly thought, oh my God, if I come back tomorrow, let's check out in which direction the moon would, the moon would rise. And then all you got to do is get uh, an app, um, you know, such, uh, such as PhotoPills. It's what it's called, the one that I used for this. Or there's another app called Light Track. Um, yeah. And that will actually show you uh, in which direction the moon rises. Right. Fantastic. Also, what time it rises and everything else. Right. So, yep. luckily, I had one more day. Right. And I had sort of my eyes open and I noticed this in time so that all I had to do was come back the next day and capture Set it. it up and go. Right. right. Okay. Sorry. But to, I have a whole series of that. But it was a good question. And I thought I, I knew I knew you're into using your apps and understanding where things are happening. So, it's a very good answer. Thanks. 
Okay, so this we also talked about a little bit already. Um, so um, I want to I want to focus in maybe on um, one of the points here. Um, obviously, I, I told you already. I, I'm big on the fact that uh, that it's how I got started. So therefore, I'm sort of predisposed to it. But uh, but one step on here is it allows for further editing compared to color. That's that's a that's a controversial maybe, but uh, but to me a very big one. Um, and this relates to the fact, this relates to the, the one up top, which is we talked about already, you know, black and white, we don't see the world in black and white. We can, we can make white snow black, right? And when you look at a black and white photograph, your viewer may not know that this in fact was white snow. But if you try with a color photo to saturate, you keep saturating the green grass and the blue sky, at some point, it's going to be like, man, you way overdid it right like that that's just like too much too much photoshop and it's because we see the world in color so we have that expectation and i do this sometimes you know just for for a visual exercise like i take i i i don't like presets um you know in general but sometimes it's actually very interesting to use a preset that is kind of crazy that would do something that you would never do and you end up with the same potential, you end up with the same potential learning outcome as you did if you use manual exposure and you're underexposed by seven stops. You right. might see something that you like, right? And in, I'm telling you that I think that in black and white, there is more leeway on that, which doesn't mean you have to use it, but it's certainly nice that it's there if you want to, right? Um, and now we talked about this a little bit as well. Um, and I just... I want to go back. Uh, I want to go, sort of underline the commitment, the commitment part. Uh, and you know, I tell you, for me, um, well, as as you know, Walter, but uh, but I've I've had a, a few phase one backs before, um, and then I was also fortunate to um, to use uh, like to rent them and and get them to try out before. Uh, so I mean, I was I was using phase ones for quite a number of years before I actually decided to uh, go with the achromatic. I should also say that all the other ones I had before were um, were older, used, and and you know a lot less of an investment. Um, and so when it came time to think about the achromatic, that was a huge, that is a huge investment, uh, not just in terms of money and resources, but also in terms of commitment. You know, do I really want to be all in on that? And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, that was exactly what ex excited me about it. Um, because I looked at my work, you know, from the past, at that point, it was about 12 years of serious photography. It was all black and white, right? right. doesn't mean that I didn't, I, I, I've taken color photos, but my website, all the images that were in exhibitions that sold all the, all the images I promoted, I, I promoted myself with were all black and white. So I was like, well, there really is really no risk. I mean, this is what I like already. Right, um, and I think once you make that step, um, it it actually I find it frees me up so much because while other people might get excited about um, you know the the pink sky in a, in a in a sunset, I'm like I know I can't capture that you know and sure I've seen certain images in color where I was like I wish I had color because this would be you know the one pop of red color in a sea of green or something else you know where like as a color photographer, I would get excited about that. And you know, as black and white photographer, I know this photograph in black and white just does like would not work, right? But then the photographs I I lose, I think there's so many more that I gain. You know, it's kind of like is the glass half full or half empty, right? And to me, it's always half full. So I'm right. I can forget about color; it's a distraction. I can just go all in on black and white. And 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 then I get then you get better at it too, right? Because I actually think that the camera has made me a better photographer, not technically, but actually creatively as well, because I've been able to focus in on on this one particular course, and I didn't have to veer off or second guess myself very much. Um, and so I like that. And of course, limitations are, and you're you're starting to embrace them. Yes. I think a lot of people yes. don't realize that film was a great creative tool because it had limitations and you that became a creative anchor. And so in a sense, yeah. it seems to me you're saying that this is a creative anchor. 
I think it is. I, I think it is. I mean, the the one difference, of course, to film is is that, uh, and I, I said that in I say in, in some of my classes, you know, when if 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 you if you went out for a photo shoot with black and white film, nobody ever would call you crazy. Uh, you know, at that time, it was like, okay, well, you picked up black and white film. When I tell yeah. people my, you know, my digital cameras black and white only, they're like, oh my god, you are crazy. Like, why would you not want to shoot color and then convert to black and white? But you know, so even though that's true, at the same time the one thing that you could do with film is you could just go out the next day and buy color film and use the same camera. So that I can't really do unless I want two backs, um, you know, and then we're back to the resource issue, um, at least in my case. So, I mean, two backs I can't do, um, but, um, but that's okay because I, I, I want to be just limited um, by that. You know, I also, I don't have a bunch of lenses either. I have a fairly limited range of lenses and I just make it work with what I got. Um, and what, what are the lenses you have? Good. Uh, well, I have, uh, I basically have uh, from a 23 to an 80, uh, no, 23 to a 70, sorry, on my combo. Yeah. Uh, and I have a uh, from 40 to 150 on the XF. Right, okay. So, I mean, it's actually, you know, there's like, I mean, it is, actually is like eight, eight lenses. Or something yeah. like that. You know, it's actually quite a bit, but you know, in 35 mil, uh, you the the, the 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 average photographer has so much more, right? I mean, uh, if you think about like the the what is it the the holy trinity or something, you know, like the 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 something from 14 to 200, like I don't have that range, right? Equivalent, right? But I I I mean, sometimes I miss it, and I would love to have that 240. Um, but you know, then of course also it's a matter of like how much you want to pack as well. Right. And the stuff that I have now all fits in a backpack that also would fit in a DSLR, uh, kit with a few lenses. So right now I'm still super happy carry that everywhere. It's heavy, but it's not overly huge. So like I can still go everywhere I want to go. Um, and you know, having adding any more to it at some point will get a little bit, uh, well, certainly at least hard to carry. That's for sure. Um, right. Back to images. Yep. I can um, move on. To this. Um, we have a um, question. Do you, do you, and and I'm I'm leading into this. Uh, do you process black white differently for the screen than you do for print? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, and I think you have to. Um, you know, I process for screen. Uh, I mean, I well, I I, I process for screen first. Right, because typically what happens is uh, I get something and then I want to I want to share it. I want to put it on the website, uh, you know, and uh, and so that's typically. And then also that's you know when I'm I, I love the fact that some one of the things I love about digital is the fact that I can be on a trip, I can download that same night that I took the picture and I can see it and already start to kind of jump in on my laptop. Like I'm not gonna do a, a final edit, but I can I can yeah. get an idea of what, you know, and then, and if I like what I see, then that sort of fuels me up for the next day. Right. Right, or if or if I see like, oh my God, Mark, you totally blew it, you know, never mind. then, you know, I can say, okay, hey, let's go back there the next day, right? On film, I mean, uh, I was talking with Sam Abel and he was telling me that, you know, for three months he didn't look at his images because everything went back to National Geographic. And then he was invited, you know, three months later to have a, a, an edit session. And that was the first time he would see his own images. I was like, I don't even know how much patience uh, that guy has. You know, uh, it's like, I think there's actually a lot of good lessons from that. I wish I could be that patient. Um, but to me, it's amazing to be able to, you know, go, go back. Go back, yeah. Okay. Right. And then when it comes to prints, very quickly, uh, a print, I do even different processing for different sizes of prints. Like that's how, that's how detailed you have to do it because a four foot print is infinitely more challenging than a 10 inch print. Right. Right. Uh, and once you start to make something large, you know, once you make a four foot of, uh, or five foot print, which is if you're not making that, then why did you capture it at 150 megapixel in the first place? You don't really need that. So I want to make these large prints. Making those large prints is is you're going to see every little bit of detail, everything that that you know in a smaller print doesn't show up, and it certainly doesn't show up on Instagram, right? right. Uh, so in a way, going for printing is way more complicated um, than processing something for screen. Right. 
Okay. Um, do you have more images? I do. Okay. Um, so let's go into some of those, and I'll keep asking you questions. I have a number of people okay. who've asked, um, and I know you answered this earlier, but do you use any filters? Yes, I do. Um, of course, not I that many. To ask now. <laughs> <laughs> well, not not as many anymore, right? But I mean, here's a good example. I do use filters for this. So this is something that I just recently got into. Uh, this is taken, uh, you know, in Vancouver um, from uh, you know my balcony, and um, and and this is taken. The image on the right, uh, well, the one on the left too, I guess, but that's the raw. Uh, this image is taken with the achromatic back. So uh, so this is a technique, you know, where you basically take three pictures with a red, green, and blue filter. So that's your answer for the filters, right? I do have a, a red, green, and blue together. filter. Yeah. Right, and then you put them together in the channels, and you and you actually get a color picture that started out as you know a, a black and white images, which is pretty cool. Um, so I got to play with that some more. I did some in in Hong Kong last year too, and uh, you know it's a it's a bit of a pain to do these, um, you know, because you have to obviously in the field uh, take these three pictures, and and the fact that when you're uh, you know, taking off the filter and you're putting another one in, you know, you kind of have to be not moving the camera a whole lot. Um, you know, so there, I'm not going to go that much more into it. I just wanted to, wanted to show you the fact yeah. that this can be done with your color digital camera too. Uh, you know, just set it to black and white and, you know, follow the same techniques. Yeah. And if you, if you Google search autochrome, you know, you come up with, uh, um, you know, you come up with, uh, with a bunch of different uh different examples and of course you can reach out to me and and uh, and and i'll answer some questions too um you know and then this goes on to frame averaging which is the other part of in this case though not using filters anymore so this is uh this is a 15 minute exposure here we've looked at that picture before but this is actually taken without filters so until last summer i was using nd filters and I have a whole bunch of ND filters. I love long exposures. You guys saw a bunch of those examples. So I have uh, I have a whole bunch of different densities of ND filters, uh, all the way up to I have a twenty no a twenty two stop ND filter. Yeah. Uh, you know, so then I can do one hour in full daylight, right? Like no problem. I can do one hour if the sun is beating down on something, no problem. I mean, 22, and that's a single filter, which is nice too. So it's very, very dark. But since I can do frame averaging, I don't really need those filters as much anymore because this is like, this is basically uh, uh, creating the look like, as you see, this looks like a long exposure, you know, looks no different, no different really. I do have a picture uh, of 50 minutes with a filter of a long exposure that looks virtually identical to this one. Um, yeah. But this particular one is not, it's just taken uh, uh, with frame averaging for 15 minutes. Camera is taking shots at, uh, I believe this was, I don't know, this was a 250th of a second, um, I believe. And then, you know, it merges it inside the camera. Um, and, you know, if we had more time, we can go more into it. But uh, but just to, just to say that I think what isn't put out there enough is, uh, is two advantages, um, which is, the fact that you don't need ND filters speeds up your workflow incredibly. Um, never mind the fact that you know you have to buy the filters if you don't have them. Um, but the fact that you know if you're doing long exposures, the fact that the, the task of putting on the filters and then calculating the exposure, you know, takes time, right? But this, you just say, I want 15 minutes. Boom, boom, boom. Takes 10 seconds on the camera. It'll do 15 minutes. And then the second big advantage to me is the fact that I can do any time I want without worrying about do I have the correct strength of a defilter installed. So I right. can do a 10 second shot and then I can do a 15 minute shot after and I don't have to change anything except just put that in, right? Um, so it actually opens up more opportunities. It, that's what I have on there, right? And I mean, uh, yeah. and here's one example. I'm going to play this and if it if it doesn't play very fast, that's fine. Um, but you know, here's a use case where I went for 12 and a half minutes, right? And all those people, these tourists that were walking around, they just disappear, right? And you see, even the clouds started to kind of look smeared. And these are right. just, uh, in this case, these are 5,504 pictures uh, that have been merged. 
and I don't want to try this in Photoshop. Um, I don't actually, and I don't know how phase one does this in the back. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, so but honestly, I don't really care as long as it works. Right? I mean, what we don't need to know everything. I mean, I like to know everything, um, what goes on in, inside of cameras, but this I'm happily not needing to know exactly how it works as long as it works. Right. right. Um, and you know, these, these are all frame averaged, but you know, it, they're very, I mean, look at the one on the right. I mean, it's just so beautifully, so beautiful and soft and picked up the light as it was going across the water. And, uh, you know, it really, um, you know, otherwise I would have needed a D filter. So I guess the final answer to that is uh, I do have uh, color filters. I have ND filters. I do have a polarizer. I don't use it very much, um, but I have one. Um, and then there's one more which is I do have an infrared filter and also a visible light cut filter. And those relate to infrared capture, um, which I'm going to come to right after this. Uh, and that's a very specific thing for the achromatic back. Um, so this you've guys seen before, but essentially this is frame averaging of, in both cases, 30 second exposure, right? This was, I don't remember, I want to say maybe maybe five, 600 pictures probably in the span of those 30 seconds. But again, I have no influence over that. The back decides that automatically. I just put in a one 30 seconds duration. And then while, while the camera is shooting it, I'm moving the camera up. And I'm moving it up on a geared Arca Swiss head which uh, really the fact that it's geared just lets me do this movement very smoothly. Like you can it's do it on a different head too. It's very but, controlled. But yeah, you want the lines to stay straight, right? Like all the lines are sort of staying. And, and, this, is, and this is also done, uh, actually, no, you know what? Now that I'm seeing this, this is actually the rise of, huh, okay, good thing I just thought about this. Um, but I admit I can be wrong sometimes. Um, so, so in this case, actually, you didn't use the tripod head. You used the movement in the no, camera. I, I used the movement of the lens. I used the shift of the lens um, because that actually left the lines completely per uh, straight, right. completely perfectly vertical, right? Because the problem is I've done that to other images where I moved it on the tripod head, the way I explained it. So that also works. But the problem with that is that you're not going to get, you're not going to keep your line straight. So and might not be a, terrible a terrible issue, but this is a bit more precise, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so for this, you know, you would need a technical camera like the Combo or the new XF, or you know, a way of putting a shift lens onto the um, uh, onto your camera in order to do this. Um, and then this, I, this is the only 100% crop, uh, but I couldn't resist and put this in, so you kind of get an idea of. Uh, uh, you know, if you wanted the detail, it's there. But the funny thing is, as soon as I get this detail, I decide to throw it out when I do the frame averaging and moving the camera. So, um, so even though I have that detail, I'm actually not using it. Yeah, so right? much more because I'm creating this. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's the point, right? Like you can see, like if you do two minutes versus four minutes. I mean, the light changed between the two minute and the four minutes. So you see the the light has changed quite dramatically. Um, because I didn't process these really. They're, they're pretty much just like raw files. Um, so they're not certainly not finished or anything, except the last one on the right, of course. But the point is just that if you just go regular long exposure, it just blurs out the clouds. And it's a nice image, but it doesn't have the impact of the one on the right. 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 And it's it's just something I got into. And then I'm going to show you, because I experimented a lot, right? And I got an email... Uh, earlier today from somebody that wanted more information on this particular process. Actually, I got quite a bit of feedback on these images. And when I said, you know, it really is fairly simple, um, I wasn't lying because, it, it, you know, there's experimentation involved. Like here, I don't, I don't know how much to move the camera because that's going to be probably the next question, right? You're moving the camera during, ex during the exposure. Well, how much are you moving it? Well, by feel right uh so the way on the, the image on the right you can see like i've moved a little bit too much right now everything becomes very um or at least i feel i moved too much right depends on your personal taste right um but the point is you can see it on the back of the camera right so you just make sure you cover your bases you do one where you move a little more you do one where you do a little less 
um, and then you are able to come home to your computer and you can then decide which one you think is is the one that has the biggest impact or that you like the most. So essentially, it's an experiment every time you do these. It is a bit of an experiment, but uh, it is something where um, where you do want to be a little clear about what kind of subject matter you want to look for. So in in this case, it works great with uh, you know anything vertical. So like a cityscape, it works great. Uh, I also think that having the CN tower really is important because that. You know, if I go back here for a second, let's go back to the larger image here on the left, right? Um, I think the fact that the CN tower, you can still clearly recognize it as the tower. Right. I think that holds the interest of this picture, right? Um, yes. And it follows the kind of composition you love. <laughs> it, I guess it does, yes. <laughs> and, know, and it's yeah, it does. also signature, right? So. Yeah, and, and but it's something that, you know, I was just playing with it, right? I had actually, I mean, this is what I love about teaching, right? I learned so much from my students. It's 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 never a one-way street, it's always two-way. And, you know, this was something I was with a student that was uh, really getting into multiple exposures and, uh, and, uh, and you know, I, uh, intentional camera movement. And I was like, you know, hold on a second, like frame averaging is like multiple exposure, like maybe I can do this too. Yeah. Right. And then I was just like, I'm just going to try it on this. It might work. I didn't know if it would work, but, you know, and then I get this image out of it and I'm like, okay, there is definitely potential to do more of this. Right. And this wouldn't have been possible a year ago. Right. 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 So, so this is the benefits, of course, you know, once again, I mentioned earlier, I, I love to know what my tools do. Like I love to be familiar with my camera, but at the same time, the benefit for kind of staying with the current themes and i mean props to phase one for developing as much as they do right i mean this is something that to me i mean if you like long exposures this is a game changer um right. and so for me this feature alone is is like you know it's almost like the price of admission right there in one single fee and one single feature right it's, just it's happened to work about. with me very well right not necessarily for everybody Right, but um, but for me, it certainly worked great. So, so, Mark, we're into about the last ten minutes. We're going to run about ten minutes over, and so I'm just letting okay. everybody know. But um, just to, <laughs> to make sure you've got as much there as you can in terms of getting through it. All right. Um, all right. I'm going to go and uh, let, quickly talk about this because I think I think you know. Um, Infrared is something that uh, a lot of people are interested in. Uh, Walter, you alluded to it. Um, it's something that when I first tried out the Acromatic, I believe it was actually you that gave me the, um, I think it was the 260 Acromatic at the time. Yes, it was. Um, right, and I didn't really, and I just shot it normally. I didn't know about infrared capability. I didn't know about putting filters on. Uh, I just shot it normally, and there was something, there was a quality to the file like to the images that I was like, how is this generated? And then it took me quite some time to pinpoint it. And it was that if you don't put a filter on, you get a bit of infrared leakage, just like you mentioned. So, you know, your foliage starts to light up. It's not as intense as going full infrared, but it starts to light up. Uh, and what I wanna suggest here is that to me, um, it's just another tool for contrast control. That's kind of how I wanna present this. Because if you quickly look at this, you know, the regular image, obviously this image is about the church. So when I got there, I was like, man, I, I need to, this, it's, it's about showing the church. Um, and in order to show it and have it separate out, I would want those bushes in the bottom to kind of be light, just like the sky. Like I wanna reduce the contrast of the sky to the bushes which would then increase the contrast to the structure, right? And on this back, I can just put uh, a visible light block filter on, and then I get an infrared shot. You see the middle, that's an infrared. And the difference is, in this particular case, not that huge, but it is significant. And then I can take that and create the final look in post. So you can see that I'm not saying it's impossible for a skilled Photoshop artist to create this from a regular, like from the regular one. 
but it certainly would be a lot harder and it would be more skills that need to be involved in that, right? And it would be unlikely to look like this. Well, yeah, I think so too. I think so too. But again, you know, with Photoshop, people are doing crazy things, um, you know, uh, uh, so I don't want to say it's impossible because very little is impossible. But, uh, but you know, I, I'm interested in, in getting there, uh, you know, as much as I enjoy, and I, I do enjoy Photoshop, but, uh, but I don't want to spend sort of more time than I need to if I can get it in a more streamlined workflow. Um, here's an example where you see the difference stronger. Yeah, right. I mean, strong. this is just changing the filter on the on the back. And really, again, yes, it's infrared, but think about the contrast control again. Like now you see what I love about the image on the right is the the, the dark tree trunks in contrast to the lighter fuel, uh, foliage around it. Like I think that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, uh, and I also wanted to. Right. Yeah. I also wanted to include this because here you have an example of where infrared doesn't work, right? Because just like the first image, I want the waterfall to, you know, to, uh, to uh, stand out, right? Um, so the regular shot on the left does a way better job. If you go infrared, everything lights up, right? right. So now you just got rid of that contrast. So in this particular case, it doesn't work, but that's why I wanted to present it as sort of another tool, you know, because, I think if you're going to infrared just because, hey, you know, that's the latest hype and you've, uh, you know, a friend of yours got a infrared camera converted and you just want to try it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but ultimately, if you think about black and white, it is just, it, it is another tool you can use to get the image in camera, in this case, closer to where you want it in the end. You know, because once again, I enjoy Photoshop but I wanna get the image in the field as close as to finish as I can. Right. And probably that comes from working with film, right? Where I think everybody camera. wanted to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very but if much. you can get it in camera, then, then you wanna get it in camera, right? So, um, so that's that. Uh, I have a bunch more images here. And as we go through those, I don't know if you have another question or two that we could address um we do have questions um, um there are people saying specifically and maybe they've come in a little bit later are, are you using mostly capture one do you do anything in photoshop i do every i do a lot in photoshop every single one of my images uh, goes through photoshop um, but of course i use capture one um, and i will say that uh even though you uh you know you can use capture one as almost like uh you know you have layers in there you you can finish off a picture in Capture One. Um, so, you know, I think it's a valid, it's a valid question. I mean, you can finish off a picture in, uh, in, in Lightroom too, for that matter, right? I mean, there's a lot of control there. But for me, I, I grew up before there was Lightroom, before there was, actually, I don't, I don't know when Capture One came out, but I, I probably got into it even before there was Capture One. And so right. I learned Photoshop, you know, and Photoshop was the only editing tool. You know, you wanted to edit your images, you had to do it in Photoshop. So, I learned how to work with it and I'm comfortable with it and it works very well together with Capture One, right? So to the point that... Um, that have come in that are kind of hard to explain. So I'm just going to answer them all maybe from my side just to say okay. that an achromatic back records from well into the infrared to the full visible spectrum. So if you filter out the visible spectrum, you get infrared. If you filter out the infrared, you just get the visible spectrum. Or a fil filter I've always loved using is the one that includes all the red and the infrared, mm -hmm. and that seems to give a nice balance between the two. Um, people are talking about, you know, inverting uh, tones and doing all kinds of other stuff, but you don't have to do any of that. You just have to pick the right filter for what you're doing. Um, exactly. Um, many of these images involve long duration. Um, you talked about using it for separation in, in, in the foreground and the, in the background, but also, as some of your images are showing here, it appears that you use it for mood. Yes. Yes. No. Abs absolutely. I mean, these 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 images now the these these actually aren't long exposures, but um, but yeah, I, I've I, you know if you look at um, if you look at more of my work, if you go on my website or 
you know, you, you notice that like long exposure is something that I've, I did almost exclusively for a number, like a, a number of years. Um, and just like black and white, I loved long exposure because there was um, another abstraction from reality, right? Like we don't see the world with a, a long exposure. Like we don't see the, 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 the traffic that sort of melts away or the, uh, the clouds that are, that are blurry in the background and create separation. We don't see that. And I was really mesmerized with that. Um, and you know, this one is a good example. Uh, this was 15 minutes. Like I had to go really long because the clouds weren't moving very fast and they were very patchy and only going very long really made them, you know, sort of as smooth as possible because I want them to be in the background. I don't want them to overtake the, the picture. So, uh, it, it took me years to understand why I like long exposure, like, you know, because yes, I like it for the reason I just mentioned, but I also like it for compositional reasons in the sense that they help, as you can see here, to define your subject and to bring, put into, in, into the background things that you may not like, right? And they... They take away people uh, uh, out of scenes. We've seen images of that. I have, I have a few more on my website. Uh, there's a lot of creative opportunity with, uh, with, with long exposures. But then there's pictures like this, and they're all fairly straight. Well, here's another long exposure. Um, one thing I throw out here with this image, uh, I'm going to play this quickly. Um, this is an interesting one because um, you know, with long exposures, long exposures have become quite popular and there's a lot of training out there. There's a lot of people that teach long exposures. Um, I like to think I've been the one that, uh, that, that has done it for almost the longest because I've been doing it since 2004. Um, and uh, not to know that, of course, there's people, you know, that have done it a lot longer than that. Um, but, um, but one thing that I really want to set straight uh, and show the large image here um, is that I get a lot of my students that that take um, workshops, um, you know, talk about long exposure, and it seems like everyone tells them about uh, an easy way to calculate it, and it always comes out to be about four minutes, um, because that seems to be on the outside. That seems to be a very easy formula to come up with, you know, a 16-stop filter and uh, go to f8, and you basically got four-minute exposure. And this particular work here. Um, you know, this is my dad uh, that's standing there. So, uh, so this was completely, you know, thought out and set up uh, to the point that I, uh, I made this special trip to go to Stockholm, where they have um, these incredible subway stations. I took my dad along because I had a, a willing model, essentially. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I could tell him like, stand there, and then it was timed to when a train was coming in. Uh, and I wanted to create that juxtaposition of just a little bit of movement with a single person standing there because the rest of the people are rushing around. But this is only about 15 seconds exposure. If you go longer, you lose the train completely, right? So all of this to say is that I don't think there's a single long exposure you should aim for. I think there is so much creativity going from like one second all the way to, I showed you uh, an image that was one hour, right? There's so much creativity in that area um, and I hate anybody to want to just concentrate on sort of like one duration, right? I mean, because you're not only taking uh, a shot at a 250th of a second either. Like, you know, there's so much more opportunity out there. Um, and yeah. I think you, I think everyone should embrace that. All right. So, Mark, we're into our last minute here. Um, okay. Um, I think, I think, first of all, from my standpoint, I want to thank you very much for sharing your experiences and for putting this together for us. Um, again, I, uh, as I said in my introduction, I consider you to be a master black and white photographer because you embrace black and white at its finest level. And, and I think for most of us, the modernist era photographers define what black and white really is. And for, for a challenge out there, for anyone out there who's on this session, um, if you've never experienced one of these backs, try it. You know, it's something different, and it, you know, not a, it's not for everyone. But at the same time, you know, channel mixing and all these things—they're valid in their own right, but they produce something different. This this mm -hmm. is a creative anchor that's hard to explain. And and Mark, I think you've done a very good job there. And thank you to everyone for questions. Uh, any final comments? Uh, well, I just want to thank everyone as well. Um, 
you know, for uh, for coming out and thank you for the good questions. Um, it's uh, it's it's it was actually my first webinar, uh, official official webinar. You know, despite all the online uh, training that I do in courses, a lot of that is uh, is is recorded and not actually live. And I have to say, I really. That's the part I actually, your question is the part that I enjoyed the most. So thank you for putting that out. And thank you, uh, Walter, for facilitating all of that. I didn't have to look at the questions, but you took care of that. And also uh, thanks to Francesca um, for being in the background, uh, doing all that work. Thanks to Phase One for, you know, putting me here in the first place. And of course, for making my camera. And um, I'm going to have a beer because it's that time here in Germany. <laughs> all right, Mark, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you uh, next round. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.